Well, welcome to Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short, and I am here at the famous Chautauqua Institution today. And we're going to be doing a recording on the topic of evangelical feminism. I just read a uh, book, was going over a book that has been in wide circulation for probably over a couple decades now put out by a, a woman who studied under New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce in England uh, by the name of E. Margaret Howe and she has written a book called uh, Women in Leadership in the Church and if you go to uh, if you go to a pastor's uh, study a typical pastor's study or if you go to a uh, uh, seminary class they may have this book uh, out uh, they might they might recommend this for reading up on the subject of women's ordination and women in the church and related topics to that and so I thought okay let me go through this book again I've seen it around and I haven't read it before but I thought I would just go through it and why why what prompted me why should I want to read through this uh, book that's been out for a couple decades uh, what prompts me to want to study up on this subject again well Willow Creek Community Church which is one of the largest churches in our country and innovative church that has influenced a lot of uh, people over the years to adopt a more uh, seeker it's called a seeker sensitive or seeker driven church model Bill Hybels is the founding pastor and he's been the pastor for at least 30 years maybe 30 40 years now and he's always been the senior pastor of the church but recently he's announced that he's going to be stepping down as senior pastor of the church and there's actually going to be another pastor selected and in fact the other pastor has already been selected it's a woman Heather Swanson and so she's going to be taking over for uh, Willow Creek Community Church founding pastor Bill Hybels and that prompts the question well is the ordination of women a biblical idea this is an evangelical Christian church this is a church that says it is biblical um, thousands and thousands of evangelical pastors flock to this church every year for the leadership conferences the influence of Willow Creek Community Church is almost inestimable estimable it has been a powerful influence along with other seeker models like Rick Warren's Saddleback Church out in California I've been to both of the the different types of uh, conferences I've been to uh, Bill Hybels Church I've been to uh, Willow Creek Community Church been to Rick Warren's Church out there in Saddleback Community Church in California Southern California so I know exactly what uh, this is all about and they do have a lot of good ideas as far as um, oh if you if you're looking for ideas to reach out to the community around you how do you um, present the gospel message relevant to people uh, you know there's all kinds of different things that they're doing that are very helpful uh, but one of the things that and one of the criticisms of the movement has been that it tends to in some ways compromise with the culture in order to be relevant to the culture and that's a very serious criticism well here is an example uh, this is not what Saddleback Community Church is doing, Rick Warren's church, but this is what Bill Hybels' church is doing. And no doubt it will influence a lot of uh, church and church pastors around the country. And that is, they're about to ordain a woman as the senior pastor. 
and what does this book that's been out for a number of different uh, decades, I think it's maybe two or three decades this book has been out, what does it have to say about the issue of women's ordination that we should listen to and is there any, well, how does it particularly deal with the issue of the scripture and this whole idea of ordaining women i mean after all if you're a bible believing evangelical pastor that is the key issue uh, it, what does the bible say and is this compatible is this idea that you can uh, ordain both men and women uh, as pastors of local churches is this a biblical idea could this be supported by scripture well uh, e margaret howe most of the time in the book talks about cultural reasons but she does have a section on scripture so that was the part that i wanted to particularly pay attention to the section that she devotes to the bible because after all again if you're an evangelical pastor if you're an evangelical church the bible is the final authority that distinguishes protestant evangelicals from say roman catholic or eastern orthodox churches where they rely on a combination of scripture and tradition tradition so in protestantism we don't rely on tradition as an authority uh, we take into consideration tradition we don't rely on it as an authority so i was very curious to see how she would handle scripture and unfortunately um, as i got into the chapter on women's ordination uh, women teaching and preaching and ruling in the church uh, the scripture well the evidence from scripture is lacking and the evidence that she uses and the reasoning she uses is not faithful to scripture unfortunately and this is a book that's being used in many churches and in many seminaries to back actually justify the practice of ordain ordaining women and one of the first things that you encounter you might hear the bells ringing i'm here at the chautauqua institution and you can see just to give you a little bit of a, a flavor of what's going on here this is winter time and i don't know if you can see out there there are on the in the lake here all kinds of fishing shanties so they're they're out there the fishermen are out there on the boat not on the boat but on the ice and they are fishing and it's a cold winter's morning this is the uh, big hotel at chautauqua institution athenia hotel that they have uh, guest speakers come in during the summertime bill clinton uh, all kinds of politicians come in stay uh, as well as other civic leaders so different uh, different things happen though in the winter time and it looks like they're ice fishing is the big thing now but anyway uh e margaret howe in her quote scriptural evidence for the ordination of women the first thing she goes to is genesis and she wants to go to the first few chapters of genesis but what she does is she goes to genesis and she makes tries to make an argument that there are two a, a, a creation accounts in genesis and that one only one is somewhat hostile to women in leadership and that is the one she implies that is not as authentic as the other genesis account uh, where it says that uh, it talks about the fall and she claims that there are two creation accounts and that one of them should not be listened to or should be interpreted in light of the other because the one she feels is the grounding for the anti-ordination of women view 
and <laughs> I couldn't believe that she was going to take that approach because that is not an evangelical approach. Uh, it is not a biblical evangelical approach. It's not a legitimate approach to go to the book of Genesis and claim that there are two creation accounts and one of them is wrong. That's that's not a that's not a legitimate interpretive legitimate interpretive principle that evangelical Bible believing evangelical Christians can follow. No way. Impossible. So that right off the bat should give us a reason to pause and say, wait a minute, what's up here? Why is a so-called evangelical Christian and this book was published by Zondervan, an evangelical publishing house that is normally pretty good, but when it tends to uh, cover some of these issues like ordination of women, women elders, women teaching, it tends to, to really, I guess, accommodate to the prevailing culture. And that's a no-no for any uh, you know, Bible-believing Christian. You can't do that. You have to be faithful to Scripture. Okay, so, hey, here's a new feature at Chautauqua Institution. There is a new, it's called the Susan Hurt Hagen Center at Chautauqua Amphitheater. So that's a new structure right there. So I just wanted to point that out. I haven't seen the back of this before. It's only been around. This part has been around for maybe only a year. But you can't call yourself biblical evangelical Christian and then go around saying that Genesis contains two creation accounts. One is reliable, the other isn't. And now what happens when you do that is then when you go to the New Testament, you start doing that in the New Testament. And that's what she does. She goes to the passages in Paul this is really incredible. She goes to the primary passages in Paul where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She goes there and she talks about, in that section of the New Testament, she talks about this, the author of this book. And I was wondering, what, why is she, why doesn't she refer to this as Paul? You know, why is she referring to this as the author of this book? I suddenly realized she doesn't believe that Paul really wrote that book. She doesn't really believe that Paul wrote the prohibition against women teaching and having authority over men in Timothy. She believes that that was written by someone who was claiming Pauline authorship. She doesn't spell this out, but if you if if you're referring to a book that's written by the Apostle Paul and you never refer to it as Pauline and then you go and refer to other books like the book of Romans as what Paul says in Romans but then when you go back to the book that you're talking about that contains the passages that would prohibit women from teaching and having authority over men and then you refer to that as the author of this book clearly without saying it she's saying that she doesn't trust that Paul actually wrote that book. So again, you have a situation where, for E. Margaret Howe, anyway, and this uh, widely circulated Christian book on the subject of women's ordination, you have her as an author really undermining credibility within biblical Christianity and evangelical Christianity because if you don't accept that that Paul wrote first and second Timothy and if you don't accept that Moses uh, recorded the Word of God in Genesis and that uh, they're not two accounts of creation that they're one account of creation written from a slightly different angle so, you know, Christians throughout the ages have always believed that 
in the early chapters of Genesis, there are not two accounts of creation. There is one account of creation. There is unity there, but it's, it's that there are two perspectives or approaches to the same subject written by Moses. And again, of course, when we believe that the Bible is inerrant, infallible, it doesn't mean that we believe that the authors have to have sat down at the same time and wrote everything. It could have been that Moses wrote when he penned Genesis one account of creation that emphasized one thing and then when he came back to the same topic he came at it from a different perspective because he wanted to show us a different angle on creation that God had revealed to him as a prophet. So she is dividing up Genesis and saying that there are two accounts. Oh, by the way, this is the world famous amphitheater at Chautauqua Institution. You don't normally see it this way. This is the winter Chautauqua Institution amphitheater. Uh, it looks a lot different than it does in the summertime, but this is a brand new structure. It's only been here for about a year. And uh, a lot of controversy around building this new one because everyone seemed to like the last old one. But uh, nevertheless, this was built and it's nice. It's really nice. I've been out here before uh, with the new one and it's a lot better as far as the facility goes. And I'm not sure if the sound is better, but that's not something that I can tell because I haven't been to a concert here. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, E. Margaret Hell divides up Genesis claims that there are two creation accounts one is reliable one isn't and the one that isn't unfortunately she sees as the one that Paul relied on in teaching and that we shouldn't rely on that and we shouldn't rely on books that claim to be Paul's writings that contradict uh, the, the <laughs> the one creation account that she likes because she says that would not be a firm foundation to build theology on. Well, she is really undermining the whole basis for biblical theology, whether she knows it or not, and I don't think Christians should really buy into that. Also, her treatment of Paul, and it's very clever, she doesn't come right out and say that she doesn't believe that Paul wrote uh, the passages, controversial passages, but by referring to this unknown author, she is basically saying the same thing. And this is from a biblical Christian evangelical publishing house that published her book. So you have a number of different things taking place. The editors must have felt that they were willing to go ahead and publish this book even though it's not a it's not from an evangelical Christian perspective I mean here is an author that's basically questioning the authorship of a letter in the New Testament that claims to be written by Paul and she's saying probably wasn't and we don't have to follow the teachings that are contained in it that is not okay. That is not acceptable. I think we should definitely say no to that. And we should be very, very careful about embracing any theology that, it, in other words, to get to the ordination of women for women teaching and having authority over men, if you have to strike down and do away with passages in the New Testament entire books if you have to undermine entire books and say well even though this book is supposed to be written by Paul um, we question that we doubt that it's probably some unknown author that wanted Pauline authority if you have to go to that extent to try to make the case that should give us a clue 
of what's happening here and that's a bad bad argument and I'm surprised that uh, anyone would give that any credibility I mean you could do that if you wanted to make an argument and there were tricky passages in a certain book so then anyone could go to that book and try to figure out how to undermine the credibility of that book and then say see we don't have to follow those passages here is a Lutheran house this is the Lutheran house and you can see the word alone grace alone faith alone and it says Lutheran house that's a good message be, it's too bad that uh, the people here at Chautauqua don't take heed to that message the Word of God faith alone grace alone the word alone that's a good solid Bible believing evangelical message and it's too bad that um, the people at Willow Creek did not hold to that because now for example Bill Hybels He's passing along his legacy at Willow Creek. He's passing along his, his church that he's labored at for decades. And, but unfortunately, he's passing it along uh, to a woman, a well-intentioned woman, I'm sure. She has talents. Bill Heibel has said about uh, Heather Swanson that uh, she has the most pure leadership gifts that he's ever seen an individual wow you know uh, that's a high recommendation that he's giving her and so really you know we don't have to doubt that she does have abilities and talents and he says that she's one of the best pure leaders that he's seen I'm not sure exactly what he means but let's just say it means that she has the ability above all the people that he's ever encountered to rally people together cast a vision and motivate them toward the goal and so let's just say she has those abilities and those are gifts that were put into her by God now the argument oftentimes is well if God's given a person these gifts who are we to question don't question the gifts question the application of the gifts just because you have a gift doesn't necessarily mean that you are automatically given a position. You have to go to the Bible and you have to find out if the position that you are seeking or the position that people are trying to push you into is compatible with the instructions that God has given us in His Word. Because um, that's the rub here. Um, the pastor there, Bill Hybels at Willow Creek, when he talks about Heather Swanson having leadership gifts, no problem there. I don't think anyone would question that. Um, but it's the application of what do you do with these gifts. Just because you have a gift doesn't mean you're automatically entitled to a position in the Christian church. You have to check out the other qualifications. It's not just a matter of talent. It's just not a matter of ability. It's not just a matter of can you do the job. There are higher qualifications. And one of them is, is God's Word instructing you and instructing others to appoint someone as a pastor or an elder or a deacon and do they qualify according to God's Word uh, that's the key and most important thing actually the Bible sets forth qualifications for pastors and leaders elders in his church and you can't ignore the qualifications one of the qualifications for example is that an elder or a pastor or a church leader has to be the husband of one wife well it's obviously referring to a man and it's obviously talking about the fact that if a man is married 
if a man is married, he must be married to just one wife. So he can't be a polygamist. He can't be someone that has more than one wife. Uh, it doesn't mean that the elder or pastor or deacon has to be married. Because what would, what would be the problem there? Well, because, for example, you have the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was not married. So he would not be qualified to preach and, and teach and have authority over men in the church. No, that's a contradiction. So it's not saying you have to be married. That's not the qualification. But the qualification is that you have to be a man. And if you are married, you have to be married to only one wife. You can't have a polygamous marriage and be an elder or deacon or pastor of a church. Uh, that's just one passage, and there are all kinds of passages. The most direct passage, of course, is the one that E. Margaret Howe wants to try to minimize or explain away, and that is when Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man. It's always been understood, very clear. It's talking about a pastor in a local church, talking about an elder in a local church, church leader, that they're not to have authority uh, over men uh, women are not to have authority over men and teach men in the context of the church and so i was shocked to learn that e margaret howe and many of her feminist authors and friends are willing to actually dispense with books of the bible and actually cast doubt on passages in the bible as authentic and non-authentic this is what happens when you try to do something that is not in accord with the whole Bible, the complete Bible. Very dangerous. And I'll be talking more about this subject in the future. We'll see you back next week on another edition of Christian Answers. God bless. Mm -hmm.